All right. Well, good evening and welcome to the main library, our special collections this evening. My name is Peter Sadorko. I'm the university librarian here at Hong Kong U. It's a great pleasure to have you all here and to welcome our special guests. Uh, of course, this evening's uh, book title is uh, Migration and Theatre. I won't attempt the uh, Spanish or the French uh, <laughs> versions of those. Uh, and our speaker is, I think, as you know, Dr. Nora Parola Leconte from the University of Paris Est. Uh, she is an expert in Latin American theatre, especially Argentinian theatre, and in particular political, social, and economic aspects and the creation of performance. So uh, we'll hear a lot more about her background in a moment from our moderator, who is Maria Mercedes Vasquez who is lecturer in the Spanish programs here at Hong Kong U in the School of Modern Languages and Cultures. Uh, her teaching and research areas include Latin American cinema and cultures and the intersection of the two, making her an entirely appropriate moderator for this evening's discussion. I just want to draw your attention to something that's been broken up a bit, <laughs> uh, which is our Jorge Luis Borges uh, exhibition. Uh, these are some rare publications of his, first editions, etc., which have come from, I'm not exactly sure, from the consulate, uh, indirectly or directly, uh, plus the boards outside. Uh, normally that would be set up here for this month for the uh, Argentine Festival of November 2014, which is sponsored by the Consul General of Argentine. So um, please take some time to have a look at those. And I'd like to extend my personal appreciation to Luciano and Eduardo and all the people at the Consul. So please stand up and identify yourselves. Thank you um, for sponsoring the exhibition and this book talk and for bringing the wonderful wine and empanadas. So please enjoy the book talk tonight and I'll see you later. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you so much. Um, yeah. Oh, hello. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for being here, um, uh, particularly our distinguished guests from the Consulate in Argentina. And thank you for your introduction. Yeah, it is an honor to have today an expert in uh, Latin American theater, um, Dr. Parola, as uh, um, Professor Sidorco said before, um, uh, is an associate professor at the University uh, UPEC of Paris. And she's also, she also collaborates uh, with two research groups uh, actively, ALIM, on Latin American history and memory, and IMAGER uh, is a research institute for German, English, Spanish, and Italian uh, speaking worlds. Um, she's an expert, as I said, in Latin American theater, mainly from Argentina, and her research focuses not only on theater as a literary genre, but also as a genre that is uh, whose performance and creation is directly um, um, you know, linked to the socio-economic and political context in which uh, it is produced, and this is always like that, but she uh, studies it explicitly with that focus uh, in her work. In addition to studying um, Argentine theater, um, the influence of immigration in Argentine theater, she has also published uh, numerous articles on identity and theater, on uh, women and uh, women as writers and women as uh, subjects represented uh, on the theater. And today she's, uh, I understand that she's uh, mainly going to focus on migration and theater, which is uh, such a fascinating topic and also so interesting given the global flows of, uh, you know, human flows today. So, um, you know, um, she's going to talk for about 45 minutes and then we will have some time for questions. So I, I hope you have some very interesting questions. And without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Uh, Dr. Parola. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Mercedes. Uh, it's, you know, it's an art. It's an honor for me to be here, and um, I hope I can, you know, um, pass in a way to you what it's my passion, which is, you know, theater and the way I consider theater um, in relationship to uh, Argentina and Argentine uh, culture and identity. So um, this, or what I'm, I'm going to talk about mainly, um, I, as the subject is not really that much worked or known 
outside Argentina or in special circle, circles in the Latin American research world, um, I thought it would be important not only to introduce uh, the articles that are in the, in the review, but um, to also give you somehow a background of uh, what happens before the period that is going to be um, presented in, in the interview, um, in the interview, in the review, sorry. So another thing is that um, I was, when I was talking to Mercedes yesterday, uh, she told me that it would be important to put things into perspective for th mainly the public that have not much knowledge of what is Argentina or, um, you know, the theater development not only in Argentina, but also you know, in, in, the, in Europe and in the world itself. So, um, the influence of immigration in Argentine theater. The role of immigration has great influence across social, political, and literary spectra in Argentine theater. One of the social uh, foundations of this South American country is the concept of the melting pot. And I thought it would be appropriate to quote uh, Borges. And um, Borges would say, Mexicans come from the Aztecs, Peruvians come from the Incas, and Argentines come from the boat. Um, this is very important because I think in all Latin American countries, um, Argentina and Uruguay are the ones that have most uh, profit, in a way, of all the different flux of uh, immigration. Uh, it was mainly, at the beginning, it was mainly from uh, Europe and all the Mediterranean area, because many of them also came from the Middle East. But it was also um, important to, to, you know, to focus on the fact that Argentina, in a way, it was made by all this you know, important uh, migratory um, groups and uh, how this is reflected in theater and how, in a way, theater has been, in a way, the tool for this immigration to also get known in, the, in Argentina and in the, in the outside world. So massive immigration from Eastern and Southern Europe doubled the population between 1880 and 1820, therefore changing forever the cultural identi identity of the country. The imported theatrical genres, mainly sainete, and uh, for, I guess for sainete, for the people in the Spanish department, you know what it is, but uh, I'll explain for, for the rest. Sainete is a very short uh, form of, of theater that started in Spain at the end of the 18, you know, the, um, the 18th century. And uh, they have the characters are stereotyped. And they usually reflect uh, the people in Spain. And it's usually very short. Um, it's small plot and usually has a happy ending. Well, this is going to develop in Argentina in a different way. So this is the Sainete, which becomes the favorite of the public. Its characters represented the different nationalities of this melting pot, most of the time shown through caricature. And uh, as I said before, uh, what is going to concern mainly the book is that because of the second half of the 20th century, witness three phenomena. The immigration from neighboring countries, mainly Bolivia, Peru, and Paraguay. Second, the immigration of Asians, mostly Chinese. But we had to keep in mind that uh, Asian immigration, it was first Japanese, beginning of the century. Then it was Korean, 60s and 70s. It's interesting because many of the Koreans came to work in the tea plantations in the northern part of the country. We have tea also, and we have also tea plantations. We also have mate plantations, which is typical from Argentina. And also, and the, late, the latest one was Chinese. It was first from Taiwan, and then from mainland China. So that's the largest part, and that's what you know, influenced a lot 
Argentina right now. And there is also a third factor which is important, is the minor migration of the first immigrants' descendants back to Europe. So, due to political situations, economical situations, lots of Argentines that were already second, third, fourth generation Argentines go back to Europe and bring their culture to Europe. And we're going to see specifically the case of many Argentines that had gone into the theater scene in Spain, uh, mainly Barcelona and Madrid. So those are going to carry in their luggage new forms of theater techniques that would enrich the old continent. So in Latin America, this migratory phenomenon has always been closely related to the culture and the intellectual world. The theater scene is not exception. These human flows bring with them multiple representations. The images reflecting a local or foreign group will be interpreted according to the reality of each country. The same would apply to those representing the living experiences related to these human displacements. At the end of the 19th century, in Argentina and Uruguay, the local scene started staging the vivicitudes of the immigrant, his difficulties in adjusting to everyday life, and his crowded and unhealthy living conditions in the conventillo. Which is the com what is the conventillo? The conventillo is a single house that usually has many rooms. And in each room, you would find a family. It was extremely crowded, and each one was piled up in every room. So this is going to be shown in the first place related to the immigration. So theater became the first literary genre to portray this difficult life. As it was mentioned before, the sainete, the popular Spanish theatrical form, will be adopted to stage the immigrant. And this is the first change that is going to happen. In the Spanish sainete, it's always going to be a nice comedy, you would get a lot of laughs, and it would end happily. Well, now the change is going to be, sainete is going to become national sainete, our sainete. So we're going to laugh, we're going to laugh at the representations of all the different immigrants in the play, but we're going to laugh, we have a hollow laugh at the end, because it's going to be sad. The ending is not going to be happy, okay? So this is also important to know that how, in a way, theater starts in Argentina and how it's going to also mark, in a way, Argentina for, like, till the 1950s. We're going to have the first Sainete, in a way, performance. And the first play is going to be a play that most of us Argentines know, that is called Juan Moreira. Juan Moreira is, and I don't see very rec much recognition there, but anyway. <laughs> Juan Moreira, it's very important because it's the story of a gaucho. Do you know what a gaucho is? It's an Argentine cowboy. And it's going to be uh, what the, the problems this gaucho figure is going to have and how it's going to end up tragically. What is important is that this first performance is going to be done in a circus. And this circus is owned by it, an Italian company, an Italian family. So it's interesting that the people that are going to do the representations are Italians. But they're showing something that is typical Argentinian. So, and this is also important in the way of Teatro Popular, you know, theater, popular theater, theater of the people, because this kind of um, theater is going to be shown in all the small circuses that are going to go around Argentina till the 50s. They're going to have, at the beginning, the first part of the 
the show. It's going to be, you know, with the clowns and, you know, malabaristas, etc. And the second part they're going to show always is short play. And the short play is going to be, most of the time, related to Argentina and gauchos or immigrants. So it's interesting that for many people, especially people that live in the country, the first theatrical experience is going to come through the circus. Well, that's, you know, to get somehow the way, you know, uh, theater got to be, you know, this kind of theater got to be very well known in Argentina. So uh, this first drama, we talk about Sainete and then what Sainete, how it became national, Sainete. And then we get to uh, a very important uh, first theatrical genre, which is going to be the grotesco criollo. El grotesco criollo is not just the blend of the sainete, but it was going to have influences from the esperpento that you probably, the Spanish people would know, from Valle Inclán, which is, you know, a very important Spanish uh, play writer. And also from another playwright, but in this case it's going to be Luigi Pirandello, which has the Teatro del Grotesco, mm -hmm, which is Italian. And we had to also keep in mind that people that came from Argentina, the two main uh, flux of immigration, flujos migratorios, is going to be Spain and Italy. That's why we get all of Argentina, you know, all the Argentines we get, uh, um, you know, um, mocked a lot because we speak Spanish, but with an Italian intonation, okay? And that's because it's related to, you know, the migratory things, uh, background. So one of the most important characteristics of this grotesco criollo is the way its characters are portrayed. There are stereotypes of the countries they represent. The Italian immigrant will become el Tano, the Spanish, el Gallego, and also the Spanish always ask why do we all, they call us all Gallegos if we come from different kinds of, you know, parts of the country, but it goes all the way back till, you know, the 19th century. The Eastern Europeans, most of the time, picturing the Jew, Jewish immigrant fleeing the pogroms. And unfortunately, they're going to be called El Russo, the Russians. They have nothing to do with Russia. On the contrary, they had to flee because they were persecuted. And also, another matter is the Middle Eastern ones. It didn't matter if they were Lebanese, Syrian, Palestinian, or even Sephardi Jews. They became El Turco, Turcos, as they were all carrying a Turkish passport. These characters were portrayed as caricatures. The body language was supposed to imitate their ethnic or religious groups. Their speech will produce the difficulties they had speaking Spanish properly or simply making themselves understood. Their everyday life miseries were shown in such a way that the public would be prone to laugh. This laughter is inherent to the grotesque. It is the kind of laughter that makes you feel like crying at the same time. It is the hollow laughter that I, you know, I mentioned before. This dichotomy, theater immigration, is prevalent in the first half of the 20th century and would consequently form it and heavily influence the Argentine scene for the years to come. The immigrants, in the 1900s brought with them not only their culture, but also their political beliefs. It is important to remember that Europe was at the time full of political turmoil. Anarchist ideas were rampant, and most of Argentina's immigration came from countries touched by them. Italy, Spain, the workers' organizations in Eastern Europe were the breeding grounds of the country's future citizens. For those immigrants, 
theater became a very efficient way of conveying anarchist ideas. The anarchist aesthetics considers art as the essential expression in the life of people and in the, the individuals. And it is a praxis that fuses imagination with labor, human activity. So as a result, any art form becomes a fundamental tool to the improvement of the human condition, condition a way to attain the necessary sensibility for the construction of a new society. These libertarian, libertarian aesthetics were put into action through creative writing workshops, as well as the staging of drama and monologues where the influence of popular theater forms was quite present. Many of the protagonists were these, of these sorry, revolutionary philosophical dramas that were taking place in different parts of the country became later members of the stage companies that made up the movement of the Teatros Independientes, independent theaters, in the 1940s. It's interesting because they would also do like the circus. They would go from place to place and they would put up small plays or they would use puppets. And those puppets, it would always convey the, you know, the ideology of freedom, respect for the human beings, etc., etc. And all those things were important because these people later brought all these ideas to the theater. Mm -hmm. That was the most established theater. The independent theaters were not vehicles to convey anarchist ideals anymore, but the ideas of solidarity, devotion, and faith in art as instrument to the better of mankind remain. So the instrument it was to, so the better of mankind remained intact. I mean, we have to do something. What we do, not only as theater people, has to have also a purpose, has to have a goal. So um, the first Teatro Independiente or Independent Theater was the creation of Teatro del Pueblo in the 1930s. Teatro del Pueblo, People's Theater, was created following the model of the Teatro del, del Pueblo, People's Theater in France, in Europe. So what it's, the purpose of this theater was to be um, the vehicle, in a way, to convey all these theater forms that were in Europe and bring them to, um, to Argentina. But at the same time, they have to be for the better of the people and to fight against what it would be commercial theater. Mm -hmm. So the important innovations of the Argentine Argentine theater that had started with the Grotesco Criollo will blossom into the creation of this kind of theater, Teatros Independientes. By the 1930s, Buenos Aires theatrical scene was well consolidated and with the contribution of multiple immigration waves, it was ready for the circulation of European authors. So we have plays, as I said, from Pirandello, from Henri, uh, René Lenormand, French one, George Kaiser, who was a German author, and of course the classics, you know, from you know, Chekhov, um, you know, from um, previous, you know, end of the 19th century. And they were staged, and also they were influencing the local uh, writers. Now I come to what is considered one of our best uh, authors of this innovation. First of all, before I go into that, um, when I'm talking about grotesco criollo, which means when you have the characters of the different immigration groups and how the ending is tragic because it shows the impossibility or the difficulties of these immigrants to adapt to the new country. One of the most important playwrights is going to be Di Sepolo. 
And this sepolo is probably most more known to you as a tango lyrics writer, but they're brothers. One dedicated his life to write theater, and the other one, the, it went into music and into tango. So you see there, tango, the image of Argentina, Argentina, what is important for, how do we know, they know us abroad, is because of tango. That's one of the reasons. So you see the relationship between this kind of theater, tango, popular, popular culture. Mm -hmm. So keep on and innovation in theater. First one, if best one of this um, theater of the people, independent theater, is going to be Roberto Art. It's one of the, our key modern playwrights. He's the first author to be staged in the Teatro del Pueblo. And what is he important? First of all, it's first, his first generation Argentinian. His father was an immigrant from Germany. The mother was Italian Swiss. And um, he grew up in a poor neighborhood. He uh, was a self-made man. He learned everything he knew by reading in the local uh, library. So you see the importance of libraries. And um, it was very important because he created a special language. He created, he wrote not only plays, but he also wrote novels. And it's, it's the way he was dealing with language and the way he could convey messages and also reflecting the way people talk in Argentina at the time. So what is important is the use of language. This moment coincides with something that is related also to Borges. At that time, there were two important uh, groups related to intellectuals. One was called the Florida group. The other one was called the Boedo group. In the Florida group was where we would find Borges, where we would find Victorio Campo, where we would find Bioy Casares. And what is important is that this group was considered the most, in a way, um, not classical, but it was the most learned group. Because these people were not, come, didn't, did not come from the immigration, came from families that had been established in the country for a long, long time. Many of them had been brought up not only speaking Spanish, but speaking maybe sometimes French before Spanish, because it was considered the language of culture. And also some of them, like Borges, could speak English fluently with no accent. So, because it was part, you know, he was part English. So, this created one group of intellectuals that would convey not only a certain kind of writing, but also a certain ideology into the writing, okay? The other group would be Boedo. Boedo is important because Boedo represents the immigration. Boedo is not such a nice neighborhood as Florida was at the time. So this kind of immigration, this kind of, this group is interesting because they would try to write reproducing the type of language they would hear that was the result of the immigration. And also many of them had more leftist ideas, if I could say. Well, Roberto Art, because of his background, would be part of the Boedo group. But at the same time, because of the way he introduced, he managed to learn from all these European uh, playwrights. He managed to create a type of 
dramaturgy, that it was called dramaturgy of migrations, because he manages to mix what he had at home with, the with all the ideas of these all different groups. And not on the different groups, but all the different genres that were coming, that were new in the avant-garde that it were getting to Argentina. So he distanced himself from the traditional Sainete to embrace Lenormand's model, specialist surrealist and psychological elements. By doing so, he transgressed the national model by incorporating the new poetics of the European avant-garde into his plays. Through these rich aesthetics migrations, he manages to cause the invisibility of the theatrical frontiers. So it was like it was Argentine, and he had managed to make this heritage into something that it was typical ours. So, as we said before, the 30s were important years to the introduction of new theater techniques from Europe. The 50s and the 60s brought the theater of the absurd and also political drama. It is important also to mention the political turmoil that the country suffered at the time. If we're going to have a small picture of what was going on in Argentina at the time, we have to think of the Peronist period from the 40s to the mid 50s that have really left a very important mark, if you can say, in, in the history of Argentina. And then we have lots of military uh, coup d'etat, you know. So um, it's important to keep that in mind because there is a lot of instability. And we have to see also how theater is going to be able to show this and react to what is going on and through what kind of theatrical techniques. So um, the second half of the 20th century would offer continuity on the same debate, the question of a national identity and also a national identity due to immigration and also the social function of art. What kind of message theater was going to convey, what was going to get, what, you know, what the public was going to get from this type of theater. So how theater in its multiple facets becomes a metaphor of the political language, of the tensions and contradictions that represent this national identity. So. After what happens, we have problems we, you know, we all heard, I guess, about the dictatorship that it was very strong in the 70s that ended in 83. So this military dictatorship uh, gave way to a rebirth of this old search of identity. We have in 1981, the cycle of we call cycle, or it was like a festival, a theater festival that was called Teatro Abierto. It was very interesting because lots, even if they were not thinking in the same, they didn't have the same ideas, or they didn't have the same um, dramaturgy in the way they were writing, almost all the playwrights uh, and people from the theater world got together and created this festival, which was three plays every day. Each play could not last more than half an hour. And it was incredible because it was the main goal was to generate a protest movement against the military dictatorship in this at the time. It was the first collective voice representing the arts that stood up defending the match attack notion of Argentina national culture, human rights, and freedom of speech. This is 81, means that the worst part of the dictatorship was almost over. And it meant that a lot of people had to go abroad. 
because of in exile because of the political situation in the country. A um, lot of people also had gone abroad because the, 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 the economical situation of the country was very difficult. Uh, it was difficult to live in the country also because it was difficult to put place because the censorship was very strong. But it was interesting was the fact that if the plays were into the absurd genre or the grotesque, they could go through the censorship easily. So many of the plays that were represented here, you know, uh, were in that genre. But what happened? After two weeks, the theater burned down. The authorities declared that the the, the, it was accidental. It was just, uh, you know, something had happened and the theater had burned down. So what were they were going to do? And luckily, most of the big, big theaters, they were commercial theaters, gave them for free the possibility of continuing with the, you know, with the, with the festival, and it was the first really movement coming from, you know, the arts that stood up for, you know, against the dictatorship. So playwrights here were able to stand up and proclaim the dissent, a very dangerous thing to do at the time. Through play staging political exile, as I said, personal and self-imposed uh, exile, uprooting an identity crisis, due to unwanted migrations. Their criticism against the social political situation of Argentina at the time was generally done in an obscure and indirect way through theatrical forms as the grotesque, the loca sainete, and the absurd. And I would just mention one play that I think it's, uh, it's important. Sorry, well, I'm going to go faster. Uh, it's called Gris de Ausencia and it's from Roberto Cosa. And it's, it's a very short play, but it's very interesting because it's a story of a family that it was, that they were descendants of the Ita of Italian origin and that they went, I mean, the grandfather had gone to Argentina and now the family, the couple and one uncle went back to Italy because of the problems in Argentina, and open up an Argentine restaurant. <laughs> and the grandfather, who doesn't even speak Spanish that well, would enter entertain the guests singing Argentine folklore songs. And the two children of the couple, one lives in London, and the other one lives in Spain. And they call the mother up. And the one in London doesn't speak Spanish anymore. He speaks only English now. So he has trouble communicating with the family. And the, Span the girl that lives in Spain, she speaks like a Spaniard. So that shows the destruction, the, the, how the explosion of identity, of roots, or where are they coming from? You know, what is going to happen? So it's, and it's like the grand, it's the uncle, for example, every day he would get the newspaper from Argentina and he would look up in their own neighborhood, which were the pharmacies that were open during the weekend. You know, it's just like, this is the longing for what it was lost. And at the same time, they're back where they came from. I mean, this is, they're back in Italy. So this is one of the plays that was very short. I mean, it's only half an hour that it was, and it was, you know, it's, it's very important. And the other thing, it's after the dictatorship, we have another uh, important form of uh, theater related to the immigration that is important. And it's uh, communitarian theater, Teatro Comunitario. And it's the group, uh, the, the group is called Grupo Comunitario Catalina Sur. And it's in close to La Boca. La Boca is the neighborhood where all the immigrants came. When they just arrived, they went into that neighborhood. 
So it's really interesting because this group was created in the 90s and it's all the, from one neighborhood, all the people get together and they put up a play that is only, they put it up only the weekend, only Saturday night and Sunday because they have regular life after that. And it's very important because one of the plays is called Venimos de Muy Lejos. And it's the recreation of the people that arrived into Argentina, you know, looking for a better life. And another one that is not mentioned here, but it's interesting, is like they do, um, they do like uh, a, re uh, a revision of the whole history of the 20th century up to the beginning of the 21st century, through showing most of the political and social moments of Argentina that were important, and that through the form of political, uh, sorry, popular theater, communal, communal theater. So this emerged as a culture, this group uh, emerged during the cultural euphoria of the post dictatorship it personified in an effective way the need of protest and liberation. This place portrays the hopes, nostalgia, and griefs of the immigrants, Argentina's forefathers. So, I'm sorry, excuse me. So with Argentina returning back to democracy also in the 83, we had something else that happened in that they recreated the Grotesco Criollo. But it's interesting because the, what happened in the 20s and the 30s, this Grotesco Criollo would be popular theater trying to show all the problems the immigrants have arriving in Argentina. What they do in the 80s is that they use the same genre, the same type of theater, but in this case, it shows that these immigrants have become now the middle class, and they're repeating the same prejudices, the same problems that the, the other ones, the, the, they were depicted as bad, you know, in, in the previous, in the, in, in the 30s. So it was like, they had become Argentine in a way. So now instead of working and doing things for the people and for the immigrants, they were just doing the opposite. So it's interesting how through using the same theatrical forms, they criticize just the opposite of what they were doing in the 30s. Now, I get to these three new immigrations. So while the, you know, like, uh, like I said in the introduction, while the first decade of the 20th century staged the cultural and linguistics misunderstandings that European immigration caused in local way of life, the recent Asian immigration established in Buenos Aires since the, seven, since the 70s brought forth new ethic and aesthetics issues in place that would deal with the question of otherness in a wide sense. We have, for example, a play that is called Shanghai in 2004 by Jose Maria Muscari that stages a critical side of the social and racial prejudices of the Argentinian middle class. And it's interesting because it's like they mixed everything. It's like being Asian, it's no matter if you're Japanese, Chinese, Taiwanese, Korean, you're all the same. You know, they're depicted exactly the same thing. It's like they eat the same thing, they have the same type of culture, that's the way they represent it. So it's very interesting because in the play, it shows the ignorance of this Argentine middle class that is the descendants 
of this first generation showing exactly the same problems that they suffered at the beginning of the century. So it's very interesting because they would you know, talk about, uh, uh, I don't know, Ikebana uh, mixed with um, uh, food, um, you know, green tea. Every, it's like everybody's the same, no matter where they come from. And it's very interesting also to know that um, the, genera the, last genera the last migration from China and Taiwan, it's been so large that now we have Chinatown that Argentina did not have a Chinatown before. We have a very good neighborhood that has been converted into our Chinatown and you're welcome to Chinatown and it has everything related to, you know, Chinese culture. But even though it's been developed so much and they have taken such an important place in the society, there's still this misunderstanding about the other. That's what I'm talking about, otherness, you know? And also what is interesting is that most of our small um, convenience stores are Chinese. And they're open all the time, so it's great because if you're lacking, I don't know, milk or whatever, and you can go Sunday evening, because Argentina, Sundays is closed, Sunday evening you can go and you can get fresh milk, etc., etc. But anyway, that's for just um, information. So, the Sainete genre in this case of Shanghai, which is deeply rooted in the traditional uh, Argentinian theatrical tradition, is going to be reinterpreted by means of parody. Kitsch, snobbery, and frivolity which confuses everything and also prejudices, intolerance, and discrimination. Once again, the prejudice of the middle class, issues from those who arrived as immigrants themselves, prevailed. Now, we go to the second group. And the second group, uh, the second type of immigration, recent immigration, as I said, is from countries like Paraguay, Peru, and Bolivia. But that's, that it's very interesting because that sends us again at the beginning of the century. And we see that most of the characters that came from other places are going to be mostly Westerner Europeans. But we're never going to find a character that is going to be black African. So black Africans, when there is mention in the theater, Black Africans are going to be from Africa. They're not part of Argentina. And also, what is important is that um, the, our native Indians, they're not represented also in that kind of, in the theater. So it's important here that, what is important here is that we're going to have the Bolivians that are going to be part of a new character in the theater. And because Bolivians are the latest and the largest immigration that Argentina has received. But what is important too is that Bolivians are, um, most of them are of Indian, American Indian origin. So they don't look sometimes that similar to Argentines. So of course, we're going to have cases of xenophobia and racism. And it's going to be, oh, it's like they're always like outside and they're dirty and they're lazy and they're taking advantage of us. It's always like this phobia about the other that is coming towards us without remembering that that was what they suffered when they arrived at the end of the 19th century and the 20th century. So the case of the Bolivians, and I guess you, you're probably studying that in, because there's more cases of Bolivianos being part of the arts in cinema than in theater. But it's interesting also to know that um, places, a place where uh, they're a character are also plays done by the same author that I had mentioned before 
that worked with characters that that the show characters with, that were from Chinese or Asian origin. So one of the most important plays in this case is going to call Grasa. Uh, and it was written and uh, played for the first time in 2003. And why Grasa? Grasa is because they cook with grease instead of with butter or with oil. And also grasa, it's in Argentine slang, is considered like, you know, you're not very well brought up, educated, etc. So this this um, this group, it's been isolated and snubbed by the locals and they're being nicknamed, for example, bolitas. They're very well represented, mainly in, mainly in theater, and, uh, but mostly in, in cinema. So we, we get to the last point, and uh, this is how ideas go back and forth, and dramaturgy goes back and forth between Argentina and Europe, maybe. So we saw that at the beginning of the 20th century, we have mainly uh, Argentinians playwrights would take models from, from European uh, playwrights or Americans in that case, like um, Miller, for example. But then what would happen? They would create their own theater. In, after the dictatorships in the 80s and the 90s, there was a rebirth of not only playwrights, but of theater techniques. Argentina managed to reach a very important level of theatrical techniques, not only in the, as I said, in the text, but also in the staging techniques. So what is important is that all this now is going from Argentina to Europe. And in that case, it's, it's important, for example, the case of Catalonia. So um, in the 21st century, beginning in the 90s and the 21st, a succession of playwrights, directors, and theater artists from Argentina left their imprint, uh, imprint uh, upon the Barcelona theater landscape, and by, of course, by extension, that of Catalonia. An artistically fertile ground that since the 80s and since the period of democratic transition, because finally we went back to democracy somehow, you went back to democracy a little bit earlier than us, but you know, it was somehow at the same time. But it was a big opening and also from the culture point of view, it was also an explosion. So, um, Spain has shown an undeniable yearning to for fresh air and also for new aesthetics paradigm. And it became an essential point of reference within the world of European drama, especially Barcelona. So uh, today, Barcelona finds itself immersed in the most dynamic and extraordinary period in its modern theater history with an abundant outpouring of new drama and new theater spaces. The Argentine contribution to the current period are without question, visible in stagings, workshops, and co-productions. There are some uh, directors, Argentine directors, that would, as with our seasons are inverse, inver inver because it's, you know, Northern Hemisphere and Southern Hemisphere. They would, you know, during the Argentine summer, they would go and be in Spain and work and put place in Spain and then go back to Argentina and do you know, the same for, for the winter. So there's going to be a lot of workshops, co-productions, in addition to certain thematic and structural inclinations. Among the most prominent Argentine names upon the Barcelona theater scene, scene it should be mentioned uh, Javier Dolte, Gabriela Iskovic, 
Rafael Sprechelburg y Daniel Veronese. Daniel Veronese is not really a playwright. He's, main, he's mainly a, direct, a director. But it's, his theater techniques have been really excellent. And he's done excellent, you know, from the 90s, had done really excellent stagings, even of, you know, European plays, but in a very excellent way in Argentina and also abroad. And this being, you know, uh, you, get, you get them in festivals in, in, in Europe. And also I would like to mention something else that is not in the book, but um, there is an Argentine uh, creador, I would say, because there you, you don't get much um, uh, text in his place, but it's mainly uh, the performance. It's La Carnicería Teatro in Madrid. And it's called, he's called Rodrigo Garcia. He's very young. He was born in 1964. And um, he's, ex, he's very well known for his you know, contemporary performances. And he's not only very well known in Spain, but he's very well known also in Europe. He has come many, many times to, uh, to Paris and uh, has excellent you know, uh, mise en scène. So, I'm going to finish because you're probably getting tired of it. <laughs> so it is very difficult to talk about Argentina without mentioning immigration. And it is impossible to talk about Argentine theater without mentioning immigration. As it is impossible to talk about identity without talking about immigration in Argentina. Argentine theater reflects all these questionings. Who we are, where do we come from, how history has made us. Theater is the life history of Argentina, the mirror of what we are. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry to turn on. Thank you very much for um, this uh, detail, but at the same time, uh, you know, very informative talk uh, at the level that I think even people who are not familiar with Argentine uh, theater uh, would be able to understand. So thank you for reaching to us. And uh, even though, you know, you're not perhaps talking to a, 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 an audience who is a specialist in theater, I have been able to follow perfectly your ideas and it's, it has been a real pleasure um, knowing more about this. And um, my first question links a little bit uh, something that uh, Consul Bataglia mentioned last time when he did a fantastic uh, introduction of the books that uh, he's uh, so kindly showing to us some very rare first editions of Borges that are on display there. And uh, when he talked about Borges and his fascination for this writer, he's, he mentioned something that uh, stuck in my mind. Um, and um, and it was that uh, he liked Borges because unlike most of the Latin American writers of the 60s uh, who were very socially engaged and committed, he was a libertarian and he produced this fantastic literature that was not necessarily socially committed. And you have precisely brought uh, with this Florida and uh, Boedo um, groups and of course Roberto Arlt is a, such a well-known figure um, this dichotomy that for me it brings me as you know as a foreigner it brings me back to the slaughterhouse the famous story that um, that brings you know the unitarios and the I don't remember the others the federales. unitarios and federales you know the the divided uh, groups along political lines uh, in this very well known uh, short story written by um, Echeverria in the 1830s already you are uh, talking of this division also uh, between it's socially committed or uh, <laughs> and non socially committed uh, theater um, writers, playwrights with the Florida and Boedo group. And um, uh, you spoke a lot about uh, you know, the influence of uh, perhaps uh, uh, European in the, first, in the first stage of this cross fertilization that you mentioned between Europe and Latin America uh, of this, perhaps the, the Russian, the, the yeah. um, uh, of course the Russian, uh, you, you mentioned Chekhov, I also wonder yeah. whether uh, the Soviets, you know, with all their uh, agitprop uh, um, no. art 
would have anything to do with all that uh, no, socially committee theater? Uh, no, no, we don't have. Well, the thing is, socially committee theater, it was not really following um, an ideological idea. It was just that they would use traditional, sometimes traditional um, dramaturgy to somehow the message would get through. For example, um, we have El Puente in the beginning of the 50s. Yes. So we're in the time of uh, second presidency of Perón. And uh, the the, 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 this, this play, it's a, very sh it's a short play. It's very, um, you can say, classic uh, drama. And um, you know, it's nothing uh, avant-garde in it. But it would show the, the, the two groups that were very distinct at the time, you know, the workers and the, the people that were, you know, they were in power and how they dealt with each other. So it was not really that, um, how can I say it? It was not really following that. Following no, a particular no, ideology, yeah, no, but no, more. No, no. No, no. Broadly uh, no, uh, engaged. No, no, it was not that broadly engaged. And also what is interesting is that uh, in, at the time of uh, the 60s and the 70s, there were like two groups. The, the groups that would, would do plays more within the avant-garde, more within the theater of the absurd, more using all the new techniques coming you know, from Europe. And at the same time, you had another group, which were the more realists, and uh, the, the realists would say, we are the ones that are really showing the reality of Argentina, et cetera, et cetera, and you're not doing that. But at the, you know, 10 years later, they realized that they were showing even more the people that were doing theater of the absurd in showing the absurd of the reality that it was going through, like with authors like Grisel Lagambaro, you know, um, that you know, her mm -hmm. first theater is considered completely avant-garde, but then with, you know, distance, people realize that th that was really engaged theater, you know, because you could read that afterwards. So it was, it was really interesting how what is the avant-garde could be also, more. you know, uh, it was read in a way as the best one, the one that convey a message better than the other ones, mm -hmm. which was the most realist type of traditional mm -hmm. drama. So mm -hmm. it would yeah. be more right. like, um, like for example, Miller's uh, Death of the Traveling Salesman. Uh, that was one kind of theater, type of theater that was really uh, ingrained afterwards in more realist uh, drama in Argentina but uh, not always worked with that purpose, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, so it was, it was not really, no, it was not, has nothing to do with the, the, mm -hmm. uh, the, aesthetics. the aesthetics of... And um, the politics yeah, of, yeah, yeah, not necessarily. And, um, well, I was going to, to ask you whether there is this persistent, whether this persists, this division along ideological lines that was so obvious between the Florida and the Boedo group, if, if we have this in the uh, 20th century or even the 21st century, no, not. No, we don't because uh, you were mentioning like more like a more postmodern theater yeah. in which everything is more uh, played with and all yeah, exactly. the right and the, the Asians the are emphasis, conflated. The, the, uh, the emphasis is done in the dramaturgy. It's not really done in the texts. Mm -hmm. uh, so. Um, it's not, no, it's, um, we, don't, we don't have that, we don't anymore. have that anymore. I guess it's the middle class have reached another uh, level, level mm. and uh, they, don't, they don't need that anymore. Mm -hmm. And you were mentioned that, m mentioning that the Asians are starting to be represented in the, in the theater scene. I just wonder, I know, for instance, this performer Ignacio Juan, who is very famous uh, because he performed in the, in the film, uh, uh, a Chinese Takeaway by Sebastian Borenstein. And well, uh, I, I just wonder whether there are any Chinese uh, theater directors or um, there is an increasing number of Chinese performers 
or um, no, there aren't very many. It's unfortunately, still... it's just it's something that it's it's something that they have not. Uh, it's a sphere, you know. It's it's it's. They haven't reached. They the, haven't yeah. reached that yet. They're being represented as part of the culture, but they're not really. They don't have an acting part, if you can say. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's very inter very interesting because I just got back from Argentina. I was there the last three weeks. And I went to see a play, and uh, it's in the old Teatro del Pueblo that still exists. And um, one, uh, the, the play, it's um, Terraplén, which is it's related, it's like a um, metaphor of um, Cain and Abel, you know, the two brothers, and uh, related to the Bible, but at the same time, stays like at the beginning of the century in Argentina and the father is not well supposed to be God but um, it's this gaucho you know that that's the owner of the land but it's it's you can see many different um, layers. layers of meaning during the whole play and it's interesting because also the author is Mauricio Cartoon Cartoon it's part very Argentine. I mean, uh, you can tell that it's uh, part of our uh, Argentine immigration. And um, I was just reading about his life. And uh, he's, um, he's also, in a way, oh, sorry. Really sorry. I didn't know that it was on. Sorry. Um, but, um, he uh, he was he comes from a family that were very very left wing, and he's also almost like also a self made man, and he has done that um, working mainly with people in in theater and also in cinema, and um, with it coming from when you when you read what he says, it's like you're almost reading and. Um, a pamphlet from from the anarchist time, and uh, that's his life. He's somebody from my generation, so um, you know. And it's one of the best playwrights right now that we have in Argentina. So, um, and he he's okay, not radical. yeah. And radical so filmmakers and radical. You're famous for the Solanas, yeah, who also does he theater. Worked with Solanas. He, he, <laughs> yeah, he grew up with Solanas. You know, no more radical in can be invented. Yeah, no. So, uh, he hmm. was uh, Solana. He, in a way, grew up as a theater person with Solanas, and also with Juan Carlos Gené, who was also very important in theater. He just he died about two years ago. Hmm. Um, so, um, and this is Argentina nowadays. Yeah, so we can see so how uh, theater so well, you know, uh, represents the social tensions as well, and the how Argentina is made of these social conflicts, no? like any country anyway. Yeah. But uh, perhaps in, in places like, uh, in countries in Latin America, this is very visible. I would like to uh, open the floor for questions, because I'm sure you are very interested in raising your questions to this uh, speaker. It's a rare opportunity, so. I actually have a question, something you <laughs> uh, yeah, something you remarked, uh, Professor Vasquez, when you asked Nora about the Chinese immigrants, and uh, it seems to me, all through your uh, exposition, in general, when immigrants appear in theater, they are at first uh, passive subjects of someone else's depiction, mm -hmm. and they only ever come full circle when they are nationals themselves, four generations or three generations later, depicting something else. So I wanted to know what Professor Vasquez mentioned. Uh, about the Chinese immigrants not having perhaps their own directors or their own playwrights. Was this also true, Professor Parola, of uh, Italian, uh, were the Italians, uh, the Turkish, the Jews, and, and so on, were they only passive subjects of someone else's depiction uh, when they first made it to Argentine theater? Mm, uh, no, well, they, they managed to go into the scene really quite fast because you have the f first playwrights already in the 1920s or 19 almost 1900s so it's it's really interesting uh, they 
they managed to get into the theater scene as actors, I can say, acting, you know, um, quite fast. Because I guess it's because the, this kind of theater uh, was really to geared towards the masses. And so as they were the coming middle class, you know, one way of also getting to be known was also participating in the uh, cultural um, spectrum, if I can say, of the cultural scene. You know, so um, no, they managed, the, as I said, uh, Di Cepolo, which is one of the best ones, I think, of the grotesque. His plays are from the 1920s. Well, they, it's true, they've been in Argentina already for about 20 or 30 years. And, uh, but uh, their first, in their case, it's their first generation. And uh, his brother is the one that wrote most of the most important tangos that we have. So um, they managed. You see also, the, it's Argentina it was very small before the immigration. So the immigration, the, thanks to immigration, the population doubled. So it meant that they had the possibility of going into the scene, the local scene, faster because there weren't that many people around, which is not the case now for this latest immigration, you know. Uh, we have somehow, we have become a country, uh, you know, so uh, it's going to probably take some time till they decide that, till they decide to become part of that. Um, I don't know. I think I've got a related question, and it's about the, you briefly mentioned the native Argentinians yeah. and the, their exclusion from, from this entire part of the culture. And I, I'm wondering if you could just explain a bit to me about, or to us about, why that exclusion exists. Is it along the same lines as, as the Asian immigration? I mean, but these are long-standing uh, individuals in your country. Yeah, well, um we had to probably look into history. Um, Argentina is true that most of the, the population doubled in the, at the end of the, well, end of the 19th and beginning of the 20th century. But uh, something that not too many people know about is that uh, we have what it was called La Campaña al Desierto, which was a war that was not called a war and has not been called a war yet. And that the Argentine army uh, took against our Indians. So, and our Indians were nomads. So um, in, the, in the countries where the population of uh, Indian descent is the strongest, it's usually where the Indians were uh, not nomads, they were sedentary and also that they had built empires like the Aztecs, the Mayas, or, or the Incas. In our case, they were nomads. And um, when we were developing, and that's one of the reasons why they asked for, they opened the, the, the doors to immigration, because we needed hands to work the land. But also we needed the land, and the land was not free, you know. Even though we call it a desert, it was not a desert. It was populated by these nomad Indians. So we had what we call La Campaña al Desierto. And uh, when the Argentine army just advanced, and with also with modern weaponry, and just killed everybody. And behind, you had the railroads that were building so, and they were giving the land to all these immigrants. So, and the railroad was supposed to bring what the land was going to come, like wheat, uh, cattle, and everything, back to Buenos Aires, back to the port, and to be exported and be part of, you know, the national um, products. So, um, Unfortunately, we got rid of, rid of most of our Indians that way. 
And uh, the ones that were left, we still have some Indians, Indian groups in the northern part of Argentina and reservations, but they live unfortunately very poorly. And uh, they, we also have some in the south, which is the Mapuches, which is the same uh, Indian group as the, the Chileans. So um, what is interesting in theater that we have a Mapuche lady that has a one-man show. Mm -hmm. She's called Luisa Calcumil. And uh, she has she has kind of created this one person show, uh, recreating what little has they kept of the Indian culture, and she goes from town to town, especially in the south, because she comes from the Patagonia region. She goes and presents, you know, her own show. And it's very interesting because she has managed to come abroad. I mean, I've, I, I met her in Paris, and she did the presentation in Paris. Or she's been there three or four times already. So, um, but it's, it's one of the only things that have uh, been represented. You see, as I said, it's immigration that has been represented, not the locals. So this, the locals are only taking place in a way in this last 20 or 30 years. The case of Luisa Calcumil, uh, also uh, she, she made a play about um, one, um, was called Geronima. Mm -hmm. And it's, uh, it's a play of, uh, it's not a play, sorry, it's a film. It's called Geronima. And uh, she plays, unfortunately, she plays this Indian lady who has um, her children and her children had not been uh, didn't have shots, and uh, you 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 see how you know the kids get chicken pox and they all end up dying. So, and this happens, you know, in Argentina in the 20th century. So it's interesting. There is kind of a movement in this last about 20 years, trying to recuperate this part of our culture that it's not known or completely put aside because it's not considered part of Argentina, quote unquote. It is, but it's not. So uh, in theater, uh, as I said, the representation is the immigrants, the immigrants that were brought after we got rid of the ones we had. We have, so we had so. I would like to know uh, what's the present scenario in the Argentinian theater as such uh, regarding uh, are there any playwrights who try who are trying to preserve the traditions of the past like the uh, theater of the people or the stage of the commons is it like uh, the political dramas which were very popular during 60s 70s period and because recently I saw an Argentinian movie yeah. Uh, Las Acacias, mm -hmm. which depicts the Paraguayan uh, illegal immigration from Paraguay to Argentina. So, is there like the playwrights or the theater actors, are they like uh, moving into films as such, or are they preserving the heritage of the Argentinian theater at, at the present time? Um, I guess you're. Um Oh, you, we still have, like I said, we have the com, uh, Teatro Comunitario, you know, theater, of, you know, from the, from the um, communities that present, that show a little bit of, you know, they have kept this traditional uh, theatrical forms like sainete types, comedy types, but, and they have introduced problems that they have right now. Um, but as I said, you know, we, when you were saying about uh, Teatro del Pueblo, Teatro of the People, you know, I just, um, this is what I just saw. You see? And uh, this is the play that I, that I went to see. So it's preserving what, you know, what we have. So if you have the chance of going to Argentina right now, I mean, it's supposed to be the best play of the, of the year. 
but it's also it, this is like off okay this is like the off theater we also have the commercial theater where they put on plays of important american you know writers or you know or musicals or whatever but that's considered the commercial theater this is what is really you know like off theater the theater that it's worth seeing because of the importance of the dramaturgy the way it's been staged the the working of the actors the you know the mise-en-scene which is important but it was also interesting is even though like we talk about Javier Dolte that goes to Barcelona and works with um, the theater people in Barcelona what has happened now is that these very good young playwrights or directors what they're doing now is they're going into the commercial theater and they're directing this you know well very well known plays that come from from abroad most of the time so it's it's interesting this, to this, see uh, you know trajectory to the, towards commercial uh, theater and cinema is uh, inevitable not just in argentina but worldwide I was just uh, attending a lecture by La Fura del Sbaus, yeah. and uh, after, and this was uh, two days ago in City University, and after uh, the lecture, a colleague was asking, but how can they do this, you know, this uh, theater that was so revolutionary against the dictatorship or in the, in the 70s, in the 80s, and now they are doing commercial cinema for the Chinese government, no? the commercial. Uh, yeah, theater. yeah. So this is. You know, nobody dared to ask that directly, but I don't think it affects just Argentinian <laughs> theater, unfortunately, but uh, yeah. probably worldwide. Well, um, if, there is n if there is one uh, pressing question, uh, we still have time for one pressing question, very short. Two pressing questions, two pressing questions. We're happy to have these pressing questions. Well, thank you very much. Well, I'm really amazed well, for the rich culture of the theater in Argentina. On the other hand, oh, I'm very fascinated in the country of Argentina because tango from Argentina conquered the world. Yeah. Well, everywhere we have tango. Uh, well, it's so lovely. It's so amazing. Every time tango performance in Hong Kong, Astros, they always full subscribe within a day. But I'm surprised when the theater in Argentina, they are so visual. So, uh, uh, so rich, so diverse, so interesting. Uh, the, the content w was so diverse, but it never reaches out the world for, for me, at least in Hong Kong. So are, they, are there any particular reason that, um, that uh, the Argentina uh, theater, that is it moving, uh, reaching out the world or particular yeah, reason it, it that restricts it's itself it's to, yeah. to, the, to the country itself? Well, it's, uh, there usually you, you could see uh, Argentine theater in, in Europe. In Europe, yes, you know, and uh, in the Asian part, it's very difficult because usually it implies a lot of money, and uh, theater people don't have that much money, <laughs> and uh, uh, it's very difficult. If well, sometimes it means that the government has to put some money into it, and the government not all the times have the money to put into it, so it's it's it is difficult, but in I know it managed. I, I managed to see wonderful things because I, I I've been living abroad yeah, for the last 30, more than 30 years. But I mean, not in Argentina. But um, I managed to see a lot of things that were really very good and very important outside Argentina because of the possibility that it was you know it was taken outside either to a festival or you know or. A certain group of people brought them, etc. So it was, you know, I was I was lucky to see that. But unfortunately, Asia it's far away. Uh, really it's very expensive. It's extremely expensive even to put a play here in Hong Kong, because apparently, as as you can see, if you every time you have a foreign play or even a local play, it stays on only about a week even sometimes less than a week. And it's also because it's extremely expensive to pay for the place where you're going to, you know, to put on your, you know, your performance. So it's, unfortunately, it's a matter of money. 
and uh, it's not always easy. It's sharp contrast to tango. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but tango is like more commercial, if you can say. <laughs> you would get more public. It's, it, it's, I mean, uh, you only had to move two people sometimes, <laughs> you know. Uh, but if you, with the play, it's unless you have a small, you know, like three only and very good, yeah, you know. But it's not, uh, it's not as easy, you know, it implies more, uh, more people and um, you have to move more things, if you can say, if you're talking about. Sorry, a very brief question, which is actually uh, very much related to the gentleman's uh, question. Uh, and it's more general, as you as a theater scholar, uh, aside from the particular Argentine theater, um, as an art form theater, uh, is, is what you said about resources being a limitation to theater reaching out really true in the sense that you may not be able to have a genuine theater experience without attending the, the, the theater, of course, but today we live in a world of ingenuity and technology, and it seems that in other art forms, if I want to read an Argentine book, I can find an illegal PDF copy of it. If I want a movie, I can get a pirated copy of it. Is no one in the theater industry of theater thought of maybe filming theater and putting it online, just like this wonderful university, this book talk will be available yeah. to, to people for decades to come because it's being filmed. Yeah. Do people, does this reflect the fact that perhaps people in theater are self-centered and they don't want it to be brought unless they are there themselves? Or is it just something that hasn't happened for another reason? Because it seems that divide between resources and the product, if unperfect, uh, uh, it, it could perhaps be allowed to reach another market or another audience, albeit imperfectly. It has, does this happen at all? I'm not very familiar with this topic, but um, it seems the limitation yeah. is artificial to some extent. Well, uh, one thing that it was, uh, I've, I know theater that has been, like the BBC has, uh, that had, is it, has even done Argentine theater. And that was in the 90s, you know that took some of the most well-known uh, you know, writers at the time and did a series of Argentine theater, but it was the BBC and they had money to do it. So um, uh, I really don't know about how that happened in Argentina itself. What I know though is that um, even though we don't have much money in Argentina, they would, you can find theater, you know, Every day, there's a lot of plays that are put on. Y you know, it's, it's incredible to see that sometimes you have more things to see in the theater than in the cinema. So, and this is with very small means. I mean, you don't have the money. So, I don't know, maybe the new generation will find a way of putting that, um, filming that and putting, but it's also, it's, the thing is, one thing is theater. And the other one thing is film. It's not the same thing, you know. Theater is, you have to go to the theater and you had to feel it, you had to be there, you had to, I don't know, smell it. I mean, not every representation is going to be the same. Um, it's not the same thing of filming something than really going to see a theater representation. It's two different things. It's nothing to do with it. So it's, it's difficult. I don't know. To me, it's, I don't say impossible, but it's a completely different technique. So that makes it difficult. Well, that about wraps it up, I'm afraid. <laughs> so uh, this has been a really wonderful evening and truly revealing um, the deep, the richness of the uh, Argentinian theatre and, and the cultural background to it has just been fascinating and I've learned a great deal. So I'd like you to all join me and thank our speaker and our moderator, Dr Parola and Dr Vasquez. And we have a, a very small souvenir from, from the library for oh, each of you. you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you very Thanks, much. Maria. Thank you. And two weeks from today, we'll have another book talk, just when you thought it was all over for the year, <laughs> another book talk. Uh, it is the Heart Sutra and Beyond, and it's going to look at the interrelationship between Eastern and Western religions by Dr. Claire Sitt. So we won't have empanadas, but we will have a good book talk. <laughs> See you in two weeks. <laughs>